little clarification from our conversation earlier this morning. I shared with Tommy earlier, the, um, before church, was I woke up this morning, and I have just really been wrestling all, all morning with preaching this particular message. And it's like... Uh, I've, I've, I've felt in my spirit, I, I need to do, we, we need to think of and focus on something else. I think I know what the something else was. What I wanted to share with you today is, I hope not a knee-jerk reaction. Because I've been following with great interest the events that are taking place in Wilmore, Kentucky, on the campus of Asbury University. Um... This is a phenomenon like we have not seen in the church in, in well, almost 60 or 70 years. And the draw of people coming to Wilmore because of what is taking place uh, is really shaking the church at its foundation. If you are unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, Wednesday... Oh, a week ago last Wednesday, uh, at the end of the chapel service there at, at Asbury University, a call was given at the end of the service for confession and repentance. And the chapel service officially ended, but a group of students did not leave, and they continued to pray and seek God's face. And out of that now, a great move of God and a tremendous effort of revival is taking place in the Lexington, Kentucky area, but not just in Lexington. It is spreading to college campuses all around the Midwest. It is, t it is breaking out now in the Dominican Republic, in the South Pacific, in Europe, um, in Africa. In fact, what is taking place in Uganda is, if you have not heard, is absolutely mind-blowing. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in Uganda are responding to the gospel and are coming to Christ in numbers unprecedented. We've been praying for this, and you, know, you can't help but ask, God, if it takes place there, what, can you bring it here? And here's the problem that, I, that so often we try to manufacture revival. And you can't. The only uh, revival must come from God and, and nowhere else. And you can, you can create some kind of a facsimile, but it's not the real thing. What's, what's interesting and what, what is uh, so life-changing about what's taking place right, right now in, uh, at Asbury is that this whole movement is completely student-led. There are no adults who are involved in the leadership of this. They are allowing this to, uh, to permeate itself through just through the students who started it. Uh, they've actually had opportunities uh, where well-known gospel artists, musicians, and well-known uh, preachers from around the country have called and offered their services. They want to get in on what's going place, and they've been telling every one of them, you're welcome to come and sit in the back and worship with us. But as far as leadership, we don't, we don't need what you say you have to offer. We have the Holy Spirit. And so, what I had intended to share with you this morning, like I said, I didn't want that to be a knee-jerk off of that. But the question I was going to ask this morning in the title of the sermon was, Why Revival Tarries? That's the title of a book, by the way, that was written in the 60s by a man by the name of Leonard Ravenhill. He was a, a preacher and a pastor who was from England, who, who it was quite, I believe, prophetic in seeing the direction that the church was going. And he laid a groundwork even in the 60s that said, if you, do not, if you do not maintain this pattern and continue, the church is going to go into apostasy. And he said, the reason revival does not come and the reason we don't see it today is because of the complacency of the church 
and the, uh, and the impotence of the preaching that's in the pulpits today. Um, there's no way I, I can give you that message this morning now. Um, because I can't improve on what God has done. But there are a couple of things that, let me just, well, give, give me that definition, Kim, right there. This is what revival actually is. It is reestablishing an intimate relationship with Christ and reinstalling him as the absolute Lord of my life. It is the divine work of God in the lives of his people who seek his will and are daring enough to open their lives up to his might and his power. It comes down to this. How bad, how desperate do we really want it? You see, that's, that is why God has begun to pour his spirit out on the campus at Asbury. Those students got to the place where they were desperate enough that they began to cry out and ask for it. Um, I'll tell you what I'll do. Let me give, I'll give you my main points, all right? Because I think those are important. Here's where, um, if, we want to, if we want to experience this kind of spirit, it starts with this. You've got to recognize and acknowledge the authority of God's Word. You've got to believe that God's Word is true. If you have any question about the authenticity and the integrity and the, and the accuracy of God's Word, then it's, you're going to be in trouble. You've got to believe that God's Word is true and what God says is true. Second Chronicles 7 and 14, I believe, has to be the most direct statement that God makes about people experiencing a renewal in their heart. That's where he said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. Do you see how much of this depends upon us reaching the place of desperation and crying out? God started with what he's expecting from us. If my people. Now, now, now okay, let, let's break that down. If my people. Who are his people? The church. I know this was written to, the, to Israel. But, it's, but we're, the new, we're the spiritual Israel of today. We're the, we're the body of Christ. So he's talking to us. If my people who are called by my name, Church of God, will humble themselves. Maybe there's our first problem right there. Maybe we're too proud. Let me, let me rephrase that. There's no maybe about it. We get too proud. But if we will humble ourselves and pray, and prayer takes work, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, his presence, the very thing we've been talking about for the last several weeks. Seek my face and turn. That is what repentance is, beloved. Repentance is turning from sin to God. Repentance, the word repent literally means a 180 degree turn in direction. So if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, if they will repent, I love this now, then. If, then. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So we've got to believe in God's word. We've got to believe that what he said is true and he meant it. And here's the second thing we've got to do. If there is sin, we have to confess it. The psalmist said, if I regarded iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not hear me. 
David went before the Lord one day and he prayed this prayer. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, if there's anything in my heart that, is, that displeases you, if there's anything in my heart that violates your law, oh God, I lay this before you. I confess. And I pray that you'll forgive me. The third thing is, there has to be prevailing prayer. And prevailing is a lot like travailing. You know, I believe, was it Amos who said when Zion travails, she brings forth her children? It's like a woman in childbirth. There's wailing at times. It's painful. But with the birth, there is such joy. And that's the way it is with, with prevailing, travailing prayer. As, we, as, as prayers are offered and, and the work is put into it, the labor, the pain that sometimes is required, then God births an answer that brings great joy. The fourth thing, the fourth main point I wanted to give you is from there we have to bear our cross. And I'm not talking about picking up a literal cross and carrying it with you everywhere you go. The cross that you bear is going to be whatever it is that God puts upon your heart to do. Whatever calling he places on your life, whatever burden he lays upon you, whatever ministry he may direct you into. That is a cross for you to bear. And your purpose in bearing the cross is you are taking with you the sacrifice of Christ everywhere you go and allowing that to work through you to the people you encounter. And bearing the cross is hard work. There are times you don't think you can, you can get up, you can, you can handle the load. But those are, the, those are the times that he gets up under there and carries it with you. You remember what, what he said to the disciples today? He said, if any of you are, are, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, take my yoke upon you and learn of me and you will find rest for you. The purpose is he gets underneath there and helps us carry it. And those things, beloved, are just starting points. Why does revival not come to the church? Why doesn't it come? It's because we've got to get desperate enough to ask for it. And like I said, I believe the biggest, the biggest obstacle we have to overcome starts with that pride. We've got to forsake all other things and just look to him. Because nothing else matters. Let's be honest, nothing else matters really matters except his presence let's pray together Lord we want to be in your presence more than anything else I pray father that you will rest among us today as you already have but as as much as we've been aware of your Holy Spirit at work in this place today Lord I pray that you would do even something more God I pray that you would you would break our hearts crush our spirit if necessary and make us desperate enough to ask and to seek 
and to turn. Lord, I pray for your church today. If revival is going to come into our midst, it's going to be because we've acknowledged who you are and that your word is true. We've got to confess sin if it is present. We've got to pay the price in prayer. We've got to labor for your spirit to work. And then we've got to carry the load that you place on us, knowing that we don't carry it alone. But you'll be there to walk with us. Are we willing, Lord, to, to pay a price like this? It's, it's high. It's going to require much of us. But God, to make this possible, you required everything from you. Because you gave your only son to make these things possible. You sent Jesus into the world to die so that our sins could be forgiven and we could have hope for eternity. Lord, we hit periods in our life, though, where we are in desert times and our spirits get dry. I pray that today might be a day of refreshing rain, the rain of your Holy Spirit. And may you come and do a work in us, collectively and individually, and restore us, renew us, revive us again, Lord, we pray. We seek your face today, and we wait for you to come in Jesus' name.